never thought Jiu-Jitsu could teach me so much about fundamentals of life. Jiu-Jitsu is hard and it can be demoralizing. It will break your ego into a thousand pieces. People tell you Jiu-Jitsu is easy. No, but give time. Your body, it's going to understand the language. When you open the door and walk on these mats, you open your mind. It teaches you how to work towards something, which inevitably becomes habitual in the way that you walk through life. I grew up in a great neighborhood, but uh, when you were in, in, in Rio, it doesn't matter what neighborhood you are, sometime trouble or bad things finds you. The problem there is you get to know where you're going, but I also teach you, I think you become like street smart as well and I think teach you to be careful with so many things. You learn very young to, to make sure you have your eyes all over your head because wherever you go, you gotta make sure you were watching. So when I was a 10 year old uh, kid, I got robbed in the street uh, by a pocket knife. Another kid, probably my age, stole my chain and I, I I cry. And I think that planet, uh, is slowly, I start to have some anxiety of walking the street by myself. And I remember many times I used to run to my house in the street because I, I thought running, they wouldn't be able to like stop me. So I used to run really fast up my street to going back home. But by the age of 13, that's when it got really bad. It got to the point that it was so bad that I, I didn't want to leave my house. So my parents, they brought me a couple psychiatrists, and uh, the psychiatrist that I went, he said it to my parents. I don't believe he needs medicine. I don't believe he needs nothing like that. I think I have something that really can help him. It's this martial art called jiu-jitsu. My parents are like, oh no, we try all the martial arts and it didn't work. And he said, no, 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 trust me, try this one. And I started Jiu-Jitsu. I wasn't always an athlete growing up. When the doctor told my mom that I was uncontrollable and, and she needs to medicate me, that's when my mom put me into sports. Basketball came naturally to me. It was my first passion in athletics. Roberts, Roberts turns, goes up with a jumper, up and in. Oh, big out of bounds play. Roberts on the line for Mount Blue. I have to believe Roberts, Peter Roberts is making amends. 97. The year we graduated basketball, we went to the state championships our senior year. And then I transitioned into lacrosse, which is basketball with a weapon. Uh, that's me right there, shooting a goal, old school helmets. Before it looked cool. I liked the contact and the physicality of it. And of course, I was natural at football also. So sports consumed every bit of energy. It actually stilled my mind. And you know, and when my mind was still, I was able to focus on my, my creativity. This guy right here was awesome. This is my art teacher. This is the dude who inspired me to use my creativity. He's such a good artist. Mr. Bazalian, Mr. B. For college, I got recruited for football. I was not passionate about football. I didn't enjoy playing football. While in college, I discovered computers and I discovered graphic design and digital media and new media. And this was in the late 90s when they were defining what new media was. You know, I found a passion in this new digital art landscape that didn't exist. You know, come to find out, the professors didn't actually have any real skills. 
They were, they were teachers, they were great teachers, but it was always running off of a book, a syllabus, and oh, we'll read the book and then come back with your project. And I was like, if I can get my life started earlier and get out there and actually go to work for someone who can teach me, that would be more ideal. So I dropped out and I went to work for an ad agency and I cut my teeth out of an ad agency. It was only a few years before I started my own business. There was a four year stint there where I was just focused on trying to build a business and raise a young family. But I had a burning desire to compete and be active and do things. And when I found Jiu Jitsu, I was like, this is something I will do for the rest of my life. When I tried my first class, I freaking hate it. And then I came back another day. Then I came back another day. Then another day. And then a month later, I'm like, man, actually, I think I like this thing. I remember my first jiu-jitsu class. You know, I was 275 pounds in really good shape. And I went in and some little computer geek choked me out. I didn't know what happened. I started getting obsessive with that thing. This 150 pound kid just choked me out. So I said, nah, can't be. So like, let's go again. And then it happened again. Every time I got tapped, that made me come back. Jiu Jitsu started controlling my life. I was addicted immediately. I guess in a way, Jiu Jitsu did find me at the right time. As a young entrepreneur, you run into hurdles. I didn't know how to pivot and overcome those hurdles. And the recession hit in 2008, 2009, and I had to shut the company down. We were in such a dire position personally with two young kids. I sold off everything except for our small home. I mean, family's everything. This was uh, 2008. We went to Prince Edward Island. It was right as we were losing everything. Kind of the world was crashing down and we found this little cabin to stay at with the family. We drove, I don't know, seven, eight, nine hours up to Prince Edward Island away from everything. Jiu-Jitsu was the one thing I had that was stable outside of my family. I had Jiu-Jitsu and it became the thing that kept me sane. So I went all in on it, head first, arms tucked. You know, Amanda's like, I want you to put a resume together and go get a job. And I put a resume together and I never sent it out. And she was just trying to survive with the kids, working at the local school. So cool now, married to a hot librarian. <laughs> well, I was off gallivanting trying to do this jujitsu thing and build this newsletter, BJJ Weekly. I decided with a friend of mine that we would start this online newsletter. He came to me and we put this idea together and went out there and started driving around, filming jujitsu techniques and putting it online. We had a few sponsorships and a little bit of money. During my travels, Alexei, a friend of mine and one of my instructors introduced me to Dedeco. And he's like, Pete, you gotta go film with this guy. He's old school Brazil, dude's good. One time someone asked me, Dedeck, why do you hate so much to lose? I said, because I hate that feeling that I had to look at him there and they smile on their face. I fucking hate that, man. That's the stage championship, which back in the day used to be the biggest tournament. Like, they didn't have Brazilian championship, so it was the state. Yeah, I won this one. I like, don't look at these photos too often. Maybe last time I looked at those, maybe it was like, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You forget, you know? Sometimes it's good to look, it brings you back, it brings you back. I love this one. Brazilian Championship, uh, Brown Belt, I think in 1996. Uh, this is my father, right here. This is my brother, right back here. It's. Uh, 
reminds me how much our Jiu Jitsu has done for me. You know, all the work, everything worth it. What? Jiu Jitsu gave me everything I have. Everything. The peace that I have in the morning, the tiredness that I have at night before going. The way that I like to help people, you know, Jiu-Jitsu gave me the way that I feed my family, the way that I can help people feed their family. Jiu-Jitsu gave me everything, man. Everything I have. I drove down to Massachusetts and met this uh, big Brazilian black belt. We just start like really hitting off. We just like we exchange numbers that day. Sometimes you just have chemistry and good energy and, and we just connected and became lifelong friends and quick friends. He used to call me for all these questions. He's thinking about competing. He's thinking about this. He's thinking about that. Then he pretty much turned and said, hey man, Dedeco, I want to train now that you full time. Dedeco was a really big athletic guy. And there wasn't, there's not a lot of big athletic guys that are guard players. And I really wanted to learn what jiu-jitsu was. What makes jiu-jitsu jiu-jitsu is the guard. And there was no one better in all of New England as a big guy with an active guard than Tadeco. Oh, I used to drive down to train with Tadeco every week. Be used to come here like three times a week, drive four hours and four hours back. That was the sacrifice you made to learn the real jiu-jitsu. I drive, no radio, silence. Just the thoughts in my head, thinking through jiu-jitsu, thinking through next steps in life, thinking through business, thinking through what I need to do. It was kind of like meditation. One day he goes over, like we are sitting and he's like, man, I don't like the way the geese fit. I think I can do better. He's like, I'm thinking about opening a gi brand. I saw this void in jiu-jitsu and apparel and training gear. It was like this garment hadn't been changed in 100 years. And between 2007, 8 and 2011, I compiled all these ideas on how one could change the jiu-jitsu gi and make it better. Football players aren't wearing leather helmets anymore. Golfers aren't playing with wooden golf clubs anymore. But world-class competitors in jiu-jitsu are training with heavy cotton garments with trash bags around their waist and they call them pants. There's a problem with this. There's been zero innovation in jiu-jitsu. And I saw an opportunity for innovation. I think I can do this. This is like an early, an early sketchbook. This is from 1999, I started the sketchbook. When I have something in my head, I have to see it physically. It's a burden if it's just in my head. Yeah, when Origin started, I kind of used it to design some different things. Sandals are a big thing in jiu-jitsu. We haven't done any sandals yet, but. Once I need to express something physically and creatively, it is truly a singleness of purpose and puts me in a state of kind of being single-minded. Was a, this was an early sketch of some pro pants with kind of a way the, the belt might work with the flap to cover up the plastic piece, some of the styling on the pants. You know, Dedeco and I became fast friends and right when I had this thought of starting Origin, I went to him. I said, hey, if you do it, I'll go with you. That day Origin was born, I think. So when I started looking for manufacturing, I wanted to make everything in the US. Every, every corner was closed. Every factory was shut down. I couldn't find anyone to make the garments and I did what everybody else did. Weak sauce, man. I started importing from Pakistan. Well, when we first started Origin, we didn't have any money. And so I had one gi that we imported. I took some photos of it. And then we sold that gi and raised $40,000. We sold 200 units and they didn't exist. 
super naive and probably not the best idea. Luckily, they showed up from Pakistan, and that's how Origin got its first seed money. Yep, first gig. We sold that first batch of geese through BJJ Weekly Newsletter list. And I remember the orders coming through and I was like, damn, people are into this. We are doing what we thought was right. And we are just selling and try to get out there the best product. But the best product that every single company was buying from the same place. So it was no difference between our geese and any other brand. They all, they, every single gi was coming from the same freaking factory. It's the same damn thing with a different embroidery. There is no innovation. To this day, it's the same thing. You know, you try to put tech packs together, which has like the sew lines and the construction and hope that they get it, hope that they understand you're trying to do something different. And for the most part, they got 50% there, not, not all the way there. I got to a point where I had so many ideas, I was unwilling to send them to Pakistan. You know, my factory in Pakistan, the guy's name was Ali. I never trusted him. And that all came to a head when I was in Abu Dhabi competing, getting ready to compete against one of the most prolific world champions of all time. And as I was sitting there waiting to go out on my match, somebody walked by and they were wearing Origin gear. And we were a new company. And I had this great sense of fulfillment and achievement. And as you got closer, I kind of was like, this is going to be a good day. This is badass. We're making an impact. And as she walked by, there was a different logo on the back. I knew right then we were getting ripped off. And if you watch my match that happened right after that, you can tell I just did not give a shit. And I couldn't wait to get out of there and get on that airplane and get back to America and solve the problem. I remember telling the deco, this is what we're gonna do. I think it was 5 o'clock in the morning, some shit like that. 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, my phone had rang. I saw Peach. I said, oh shit. I answered the phone to Peach. Hey, I just landed. We're going to start making easy in America. Talk to you later. What's up, guys? Come on in. Man, it's loud in the factory today. Are you the only company in America the that actually The only company made? in America no that is making kidding. these. From the cotton that's grown in America, it's woven, we weave it in our factory. We're doing everything here. 